Will you imagine that you're in the middle of a big body of water? All right, imagine you're in the middle of a big body of water in a small boat, maybe triple the size of a canoe. All right, it's a cold night, and there's wind, and there's waves. Okay, are you there? Dark, cold night, wind and waves, and you see someone walking to you on the water. And he says, take courage, it's me, Jesus. So you say, Lord, if it's you, let me walk to you on the water. And instead of looking at the impossible circumstances around you, you look at Jesus and you walk on the water. And then you notice that it's windy and there's waves and this is crazy. What are you doing? And when you look at the wind and you shift your gaze from Jesus, from your Lord, to the circumstances, you begin to sink. That's exactly what happened to the Apostle Peter, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. He is one of my favorite characters in the Bible because he shares his mistakes. And I make a lot of mistakes. All right, There's at least three major ones. You know, walking on water and instead of focusing on the God who made the water... He focuses on the impossible circumstances. Then, you know, he denied Jesus three times. And then also he was racist. If you look in Galatians, that his Jewish buddies were around, so he wanted to ignore the Gentiles. All right, but when he messed up, he didn't give up, he fessed up. We see him confessing that Jesus is his Lord three times in John 21. And God took Peter's misery and his mistakes and gave him an amazing ministry. So from Peter, we learn we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. And all of us shift our gaze from Jesus to the circumstances of this world. All of us make that mistake. And Solomon, King Solomon, we're continuing through the book of Ecclesiastes, about 900 years before Peter, writes this amazing account of life under the sun. All right? It's like his journal, and the handout looks like it was ripped right out of his journal today. Yeah? Um, it's this amazing book of the Bible that doesn't seem like it should be in the Bible. Okay, Ecclesiastes 4, verses 1 through 6. Go ahead and open your Bibles to there. I don't think you'll find any bumper stickers in today's passage. Okay, You wouldn't want to take one of these verses and put it on your bumper, probably. Okay, And it kind of just gets worse and worse. But it's talking about life under the sun. It's talking about life in this fallen world. These impossible circumstances that we're in, and we're in it because of our sin. Okay, we've all sinned against others and caused pain and suffering, and then we've all also been victims of sin and experienced pain and suffering because of the mistakes that have been made and the choices that have been made by others. So we're in this sinful world and it's fallen but God calls us to keep our eyes on Him. Okay, so let's pray, and hopefully that's, you know, that's the main idea of this message today. We're talking about politics and money and religion, <laughs> okay, which are three conversations you don't want to have at dinner table with guests that you don't want to offend, right? That's what I actually heard somebody say, you know, avoid politics and money and religion. It doesn't win you any friends. But the Bible's real, and Solomon wrote a real book and he wants to get to these heart issues in our lives. So it's going to be exciting. Um, but let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, it's only by your Spirit that we have any understanding, God. Only your Holy Spirit's guidance this morning as we open your Word is going to let us apply any of these truths and truly have wisdom. We just pray that you would totally be glorified, Lord, as you point us to Jesus, who's our perfect example and our righteous Savior, God. I pray that today we would just focus on you today, that we wouldn't lose our awe of how great you are, and that you would just reveal yourself to us in fresh new ways, we pray. So yeah, I just pray you do some heart surgery this morning. We love you. Thank you for this time. Teach us each exactly what you want us to see, and give us the strength to live it out, we pray. To you be all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, reminder, Solomon, our author, was a king. He had all the stuff, all the status, all the pleasure that you could want to have under the sun. This book was this great experiment, and he found that nothing under the sun would satisfy your, what? Soul. Okay, try that again. Nothing
nothing under the sun will satisfy your soul. You know, only Jesus will satisfy your soul. And the God who created the sun calls us to look onto him. Okay, and Solomon, toward the end of the book, he tells us that the whole purpose of life, which is awesome to know, right? If you're alive, you want to know the purpose, is to fear God and keep his commandments. You know, to have a relationship with the God who made this world and follow what he says. Okay, but life under the sun is pretty difficult. Will you stand with me? And I'm just going to read this passage this morning. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 1. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible, but feel free to follow along in your whatever translation you have. Ecclesiastes 4.1 Again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. And I thought the dead who are already dead more fortunate than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. Oh, it ends there, huh? It's hard. Then I saw that all toil and all skill and work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. The fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and a striving after wind. Father, again, we just ask for wisdom from your Holy Spirit today to be revealed. And we just pray you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. Okay, first point. This is on your handout. Life stinks sometimes. Okay, write the word stinks, please. Okay, and the cause of that is sin. Okay, we live in a world that's infected with sin. That people, instead of following what God has called us to follow, have turned away from God's perfect purposes for their lives. It started with Adam and Eve, and ever since Genesis 3, we've had a lot of problems because of sin. And I like Child Evangelism Fellowship's definition of sin. Okay? And I, it has some motions, so we can remember it. Okay, sin is anything we think, say, or do that breaks God's law and makes him sad. Okay, so try that with emotions. Love to see it. Sin is anything we think, say, or do that breaks God's law and makes him sad. Alright, and any time that we think that we know better than God, it's going to cause pain. If you read the book of Judges, it's just this cycle of them doing what was right in their own eyes, and then experiencing suffering, and then they finally cry out to God, and He sends them a Savior. And it's just this treadmill of mistakes and pain. All right, and we see that here, that there's all this oppression under the sun, and that oppression causes what? Tears, all right? It causes pain, and it causes frustration. And so, much of, so many times when we think of sin, we tend to just see the sin of those around us, right? Okay, it's a lot easier to remember the, the times that we've been lied to, or that we've been deceived, or that we've been stolen from, or that we've been hurt, than it is to realize how much we've really lied to others and hurt others and caused others pain. We tend to see ourselves more as victims than perpetrators and committers of crimes. And God's Word tells us that we need to hate what is evil and cling to what is good. And that's on your handout, Romans 12, verse 9, that love really does hate what's evil. I love my little two-year-old Caleb, so I hate that someone would want to hurt him. And I, I hate that people would want to abuse him. It's evil. So because I love him, I hate evil. And I don't want evil to happen to him. And the Bible says we should do the same. That sin is a huge deal. Okay? But it also teaches that we need to put to death, this is Romans 8.13, if you want to look it up later, we need to put to death our sin by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Put to death our sin. Josh Marburger's sin should make me sick. Okay? And it should make you sick, but not as sick as your own sin. <laughs> okay? That we, we all should be disgusted by our sin. And we need to realize that sin messes stuff up. And Titus 3, 3 through 5, I'm not going to have you flip around a lot, but will you flip with me to Titus chapter 3 in your Bible? 
And this is Paul writing a letter to a pastor, a, a new church plant. Okay, Paul went to Crete and preached and stirred people up and made people mad and told them about Jesus. And then he asked Titus to stay there in Crete and finish the work. Okay, that's not very nice, right? Think of somebody coming from the mainland and driving out to Hana and starting a church and then saying, hey, we need some deacons from Kukulani Baptist to go start, complete the work that I started in Hana. Okay, but that's what's happening in the Bible. It's this great movement of God. And he's writing to Titus. And then Paul, you know, that amazing missionary and author of so much of the Bible, he's writing and talking about, you know, the mistakes that we've all made. Look at Titus 3, verse 3. It says, We ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures. Okay, you can watch TV and see disobedient, foolish people who are slaves to passions and pleasures. You see that in society, but you see that in our own lives too. We used to pass our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Okay, so we would make people mad by the actions we chose. We were causing pain and hating others, but then others also hated us and were frustrated at us. I see in there that we're not only the victims of sin, we're also committers of sin. Okay, and that's all through the Bible. And that's why we have this pain and suffering and tears of the oppressed. We need to realize that it starts there. We live in a fallen world, amen? Anybody think this world's perfect? It's not. Okay, and as a Christian, we have comfort that this world is the closest to hell we'll ever get. Pretty cool. Okay, and it doesn't mean that we can't enjoy this life that God's given us, but it does mean it's not what it was meant to be. And there's great comfort and hope in that. All right, and as we see, Ecclesiastes 4, continue to look at Verse 1, on the side of the oppressors there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. And Solomon is so frustrated by that because powerful people were doing terrible things. Alright, and we talked about, you know, when there's perverted pastors who are crooked, or when there's politicians that we can't trust, or police officers that do injustice rather than enforce justice. That makes us angry, yeah? It's not right. And when there's abuse of power, it's really ugly. And it causes pain. And Solomon gets so frustrated by that, that he congratulates the dead. Okay, verse 2, if you look, probably the Bible that's in your pew, the New American Standard, it says, I was basically, that he was so frustrated, he congratulated the dead who had already died. It's like, hey, good job, you don't have to live in this terrible world anymore. That's depressed, yeah? That, that sounds super... I mean, it, it almost sounds to the point of suicide. And he goes on to say, But better than both is he who has not yet been and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. Meaning, I have a two-month-old son, and it would have been better if he had never had to be born into this terrible world. That's what Solomon's saying about life under the sun. You know, praise God that he doesn't stop there. And it's not just the focus on the wind and the waves and the impossible situations of this life. Again, Hebrew, or Ecclesiastes 12, that he starts to consider, you know, the chief end of man. And that really is to worship God. Worship God who is our great creator. Okay, and I want to talk a little bit this morning. We see these oppressors. Okay, has anybody ever been angry at an authority figure like me? All right? I've been so frustrated with authority before, and I've overreacted throughout my life, okay? And, I mean, I thought of, in a Western world, you know, we're not as worried about people breaking into our church service and arresting us and taking us to jail. You know, we're not in China. We're not in some of these places where Christianity is illegal. But... Think of that, that these oppressors, they have strength on their side and they're doing what's wrong. And what we need to realize is not that authority and leadership are inherently wrong, but our hearts are inherently wicked. And we tend to, when we have power, to abuse it. 
You know, if, if I can tell you what to do, I'm going to tell you what to do just because I can. And that's our human nature, and it's not right. And it doesn't help anybody. Okay? And instead, God's called us to use whatever gifts, whatever abilities He's given us to serve others rather than to be served. Yeah, that's what life's about. And there's this book, The Conviction to Lead, by Albert Moeller. He's the president of Southern Seminary. And it's a really neat school. There's a lot of Hawaii students there right now. And I wrote a quote on your handout that leaders need to be driven by the right beliefs. Okay? If they're not driven by the right beliefs, we're headed for disaster. These oppressors were obviously about themselves and their own glory or their own agenda rather than God's. Because they did what was wrong and were unrepentant. And they caused a lot of pain and suffering. Alright? And instead, we need believers who are faithful to lead. You realize that's something that God calls us to aspire to? You know, if you read even the qualifications for a pastor, you know that it's a noble task. If anyone desires this office, he desires a noble task. That we actually, as Christians, we should desire leadership. And it may be leadership in scrubbing toilets, or it may be leadership in raising our children. It may be leadership that maybe some more pastors will come up from our congregation and plant churches. You know, it's, I think it was 1950 that the first Hawaii Baptist church was planted, Wakiwa. You know, that was one of the first churches. And it was a church plant. It was fresh. It was exciting. You know, and we need to stay passionate about the God we serve. And we need faithful leadership. You know, even in our church, we've got chairpersons on committees, and these are point people who take responsibility for their area of gifting and calling. And we need to pray for them and build them up. And that's a noble task, the desire to lead. Okay, we need believers who are going to lead or we're not going to go anywhere. Okay, and even so much uh, Baptist churches. You know, I praise God for Baptist churches. I was saved in the Baptist church, and my dad's Southern Baptist, and I'm Southern Baptist, and it's awesome. But sometimes we have this mindset that we're all just going to do this, and it's just going to magically happen. Okay? And we have like a committee, and everybody's just in charge, and nobody's really responsible. But even the 12 disciples, if you think about it, Matthew wrote Matthew, Mark wrote Mark, Luke wrote Luke, John wrote John. And there's point people who are responsible for different tasks and callings. And I like that quote from Albert Moeller. But we have a responsibility to lead. And teenagers, this, while you're in high school, you've got a responsibility, you know, as a student, to lead your teachers. Show them you're different because of Jesus. You know, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Even if your parents are oppressors, you know, you can still follow God and focus on Him and fear Him and keep His commandments. Okay? And I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. But lead where you're called to lead. Okay? Be faithful. Someone is watching you. In 1 Corinthians 7, it's talking about singleness and marriage and all these different callings. It talks about circumcision and uncircumcision. And God sets us up with a background and certain gifts and characteristics for a purpose. He doesn't waste any experience we've been given, and we've got areas where we're called to lead. And each one needs to be faithful to the life that he or she has been called to. So you, sitting here in the pew right now, worshiping God by reading His Word, you know, people are watching you. People are watching all the time, and we're either going to help them or hinder them in their relationship with the Lord. And these oppressors cause tears to be shed on pillows. And I was thinking about that like a fellow soaked with tears and crying and pain because they didn't lead the way God called them to lead. And it's a result of sin under the sun. So that's the first principle that life is rough because of sin, but we're called to lead where we're called to lead as Christians. And then principle two, and I love how Pastor Paul says, a lie of Satan is any time you feel worthless, hopeless, or helpless. You know, if you ever hear in third person, or you ever start to believe the lie that you're worthless, you have no value, or you're helpless, there's no hope for you. That's not from God, that's from Satan. Okay? 
And this is a lie that there's no one to comfort these people. It's a lie. Because Jesus came into this world and gave us his Holy Spirit as our advocate, as our helper, to dwell with us. And he's always with us. You know, and with no God, you will never have peace. You will never, you, you might be alone, but under the sun, we've been given grace that we can receive Jesus and never be alone. So that's a lie, principle two, that you are alone in your suffering. You know, Jesus, he, he puts the disciples on mission and says, I'm with you always. And he loves to use impossible situations and circumstances to his glory. Okay? So, even these people who were oppressed, as Solomon looked around his kingdom, possibly, and was frustrated by maybe the leaders that he had appointed in his kingdom, and they're doing wrong. And he's exhausted and frustrated. And uh, you think about this, that it's not true that there's no one to comfort them. You know, they were experiencing grief and suffering in such a real way, but they could have a relationship with God if they chose that. Okay, that we can fear God and keep His commandments. That's the purpose of our life. We really need to seek the Most High. Okay, the Bible says that um, anyone who desires to come to God must believe He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. So if you're here and you feel alone this morning, and you feel like everything's wrong, everything's messed up, and there's no hope, God offers you hope through His Word. He's spoken to us through His Word, and He offers us a relationship with Him. Life to the full in Him. You believe that's true? Okay, life under the sun is messed up. We live in a sin-infected world, and we're all victims of sin, but we all cause pain to others as well because of our sin. But praise God, it doesn't end there, okay? Um, moving on. Where's your heart with your wealth? Okay? And first off, spiritual wealth is so much greater than physical wealth. And if you read 2 Corinthians 7, 8, 9, these, books of the, these chapters of the Bible that talk about our wealth, it says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus. Though he was rich, he became what? Poor for your sake. So you might become spiritually rich. Okay? And spiritual riches is where it's at. Okay? That our treasures in heaven, that we have a relationship with God, that even if we're poor on this earth, and we're living in poverty, and suffering, and God's called us to do that, we're still spiritually rich, and that's better than mansions and Lamborghinis under the sun. Amen? Okay? So spiritual wealth, where our treasure is, there our heart is also. Jesus says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, not under the sun. Okay, our goal, spiritual wealth. Okay, and that's the back of your handout. Where's your heart with your wealth? Okay, so just get that first and foremost. God doesn't promise us to be healthy, wealthy, or what's health, wealth, or even happy necessarily. You know, we see Solomon struggle, and he gets pretty miserable. But God does tell us we can have joy through a relationship with Jesus. And then he also calls us to manage the gifts and callings that he's given us. Faithfully manage. You know, that means we're, we're all stewards of the grace of God that he's given to us, and we need to faithfully manage that. Um, look at Ecclesiastes 4, verse 4. It says, Then I saw that all toil and all skill and work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. Unhealthy competition is what we see in verse 4. Alright, that I just want to be better than you, and that's my focus. That if I can just have a nicer car, nicer house, more obedient children, whatever. It's competition, okay? And it doesn't glorify God. You know, there is healthy competition. <coughs> Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 talks about healthy competition. That we spur each other on towards love and good deeds. I was joking trying to start the service on time today. You know, maybe we can spur each other on toward love and good deeds. Is that a good deed? But it's not fun to be spurred on, right? But that's really the body of Christ. We're to be in church more than twice a year so that we can spur each other on toward love and good deeds. 
You know, we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And that, that's a healthy competition in a sense. We spur each other on. Proverbs 27, 17 says, one man sharpens another like what? Iron and iron. So you think of the sparks flying and both becoming sharper. And that's really what happens when you're annoyed with me or I'm annoyed with you. And we both say, hey, let's follow Jesus, work this out. Rather than get our friends and talk to our friends, talk to each other, not about each other, and work it out. And then that's the healthy competition that spurs us on toward love and good deeds. And that glorifies God. Okay, but this person is so focused on keeping up with the Joneses, per se. He's so focused on envy of his neighbor. He just wants to look better than his neighbor. And Solomon says that's fleeting, that's a vapor, that's vanity, and it's like trying to catch the wind. It's not going to go well for you. Okay, so that competition, motivation for our wealth. And that, right here, Solomon's talking about earthly wealth. That we're no longer in an agricultural society now, I'm not going to trade you a sheep to receive my grain so, I can, so Nicole can make us some bread. Okay, we actually use currency, we use money. So money is something we need to think about as a church. How are we using money to glorify God? You know, and Solomon's talking about wealth here in the sense of our homes, in the sense of the jobs that we do, and noticing that under the sun, people work really hard because they want to impress those around them. Okay, and we've heard people say, you know, you're just spending money you don't have, to impress people you don't even know, okay? buying stuff you don't need, okay? And that's kind of what's happening here. And it's just envy of our neighbors. It doesn't glorify God. But then verse 5, the fool folds his hand and eats his own flesh, okay? You can look up other translations if, if you'd like and try to understand that more. But basically, that's what, what, what Solomon's saying here is there's work to be done. There's some tasks at hand. And instead of doing the task, what's the fool do? Sits down and folds his hands. Okay? And he's idle. Okay? So Solomon's like, man, life under the sun is messed up. Some people, they're just running on the treadmill trying to impress others. Others are like, forget it. I'm just going to party. I'm just going to relax and destroy myself. And neither way glorifies God. So that second aspect of where our, our wealth should be. Um, it's not supposed to be based in competition, and it's not supposed to be laziness. You know, there, Proverbs talks about going past the field of a slugger, and the grass is all overgrown, and the wall is crumbling down, and things are wearing out. And that's been my house before, so, <laughs> no. Um, praise God for His grace, yeah, it's all about grace. But when we receive God's grace, it does lead us to be faithful to Him, and that means faithfulness in managing what He's entrusted us to. And we've got a responsibility. And laziness does make you poor, the Bible says. You know, sometimes God calls you to be poor to His glory. I believe Jesus was poor. We look at the persecuted church, and they were called to give up. Oh, and Jesus clearly, He said He left the riches of heaven to serve us. He entered in on mission into this world, was born in a manger. He was poor to God's glory. But others can become poor because they're lazy, because they refuse to work, because they're idle. And then they think they're suffering for Jesus and just letting go and letting God. And that doesn't bring any glory to God either. Okay? So that competition or that laziness doesn't glorify God. If you've taken a lot of tests, which answer is normally right? If you don't know, what, what answer do you pick? C. There you go. Okay, so this is the, where we need to be. C. It doesn't always work, teenagers. But majority of the time, C. <laughs> That's how I got through college. <laughs> but, um, so laziness is wrong. No. Okay. C. Wise work. Okay? Wise work. And this is faithfulness to God. And this is that tension that we're to live in. Okay, verse 6. It says, Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and a striving after wind. Okay, sometimes less is more. Okay, why 
God's work. We work hard to God's glory, and then, because God's told us to, we rest to His glory as well. We're not to be workaholics, running on the treadmill of life, with no time for what's really important. And then we're not to be lazy, just permanent vacation, in our pajamas, all day, every day. You know, it's not that either. We're, we have to do that wise work. And this principle is there in creation. God created the earth in how many days? Six days. On the seventh, what did he do? Rest. Rested, yes. And then he institutes that his people should plan ahead and take a Sabbath. That on the sixth day, they gather enough grain so that on the Sabbath, they can rest and focus on worshiping God. And then the New Testament principle, Jesus says, you know, the, the Sabbath is a gift to man. And that it's not that we need to be legalistic and every Sunday you need to be at church. Because actually the, Saturday, the Sabbath was Saturday. But the New Testament principle is there's a permanent rest for our souls, not in our own work, but in the work of who? Sunday school answer. In the work of who? Um, we don't rest in our own work. I'm probably just excited and talking too fast. We don't rest in our own work. Okay, the New Testament Hebrews teaches. We rest in the finished work of Jesus. Jesus. Only Jesus' work is finished. You know? And it's not even finished, because he's coming back and gonna kick some butt to the glory of God. Revelation 19. Okay, so wise work is faithfulness to God. And godliness with contentment is great gain. You know, sometimes it means that we don't need all the new stuff. We need to be faithful to manage the stuff we have to God's glory. Okay? And yet, there is this responsibility with finances. And it's budget time at Kukulani Baptist. So it's neat to see different people making plans so we can use our resources to try to reach this community with the gospel of Jesus. Because we need to be on mission. We, we really should have a heart to pray for those around this church. That more people would come to Jesus. Amen? Okay, so Solomon, he's frustrated by life under the sun. I hope that this passage, you, you see these truths. And you remember it's wisdom literature. This isn't just biblical promises and principles that you can put on bumper stickers. It's heart deep truth. And yet we see Jesus. In this passage, you know, Shai Lin, a rapper who I really enjoy listening to, he says, you should be mindful that all of the Bible is about who? Jesus. The Old Testament, Jesus Christ concealed, okay, we're pointing up to Jesus. The New Testament, Jesus Christ revealed, okay? And we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. When life is so frustra frustrating that we want to die, that we just feel like we can't keep going. And that's Solomon. We see that. That happens. Even to people who follow God, that happens. We suffer grief and all kinds of trials, and it's tough. But we need to stay focused on Jesus. Okay? So the politics, the people who are in charge, they're not going to be our Savior. Okay? They're terrible saviors. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 Um, wealth is a terrible savior. The Bible says don't put your hope in riches. It actually says if you love money, that's the root of all evil. You know, money's not going to save you. Jesus is our savior. 1 Corinthians 1.30, and I've, I've just been holding on to 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 as I prepared this message because, man, this is wisdom literature. The world's wisest man and I am 28, and I have two young children. I don't know much, you know? But God's Word is where it's at. We want you to focus on God's Word. And that's my job, to be God's messenger and share God's Word this morning. And Jesus is our wisdom. In that verse on your handout, Jesus is our wisdom. He is our righteousness. He is our sanctification. He is the only way that we're redeemed and saved is through Jesus. So even Solomon, you know, through faith in God that led up to Jesus, that's why I believe Solomon's going to be in heaven, because he put his faith in God. And then now to move this to the principle for us, the invitation today, have you put your heart, your trust in Jesus? You know, politicians and powerful people are not going to save you. You having all the power in the world is not going to save you. 
You know, trusting in your money, that's not going to save you. That's really just the wind and the waves of this world, and it's a terrible focus. It's an unstable focus. And we need to focus our eyes on the perfect God. Not imperfect people or imperfect circumstances. That's your last blank. Put your eyes on Jesus. And that's our invitation today. Have you put your eyes on Jesus? I know, looking through the times in my life, high school, even college, I was distracted by the future so much. I was distracted by all of these different opportunities coming up. And my eyes were not on Jesus. But that's the main idea today. You know, as we live Jesus' one love, that's that other blank, um, we live out of His power and His wealth and His glory, and then our eyes are on Him and who He is and what He's done, not on our own strengths. So if you want to get saved today, you can come forward, pray with one of the deacons. If you want to um, maybe give your life to Jesus in a new way through fully like joining this part of God's church, you know, maybe that's how God would lead you this morning. But we're going to have our invitation here in a moment. And respond the way God's called you to respond. Don't waste this opportunity. Let's pray. Father, there's no one like you. When we don't know what to do, our eyes are on you, God. And Lord, so often I have no idea what to do. I want to cry because I'm frustrated with life and circumstances. And yet, thank you that your word speaks into that. Thank you that our purpose in life is to fear you and keep your commandments, Lord. That that's the only place real hope and real help are found. Let us be obedient to you, faithful Christians. Let us walk out these truths that you've called us to apply to our lives today, Lord. Humble me, convict me, Lord, the areas in my life that don't please you. And please just continue to work in our lives, God. You're a God who can do all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.